Welcome to module number one, health promotion. I want to reassure you that health promotion is a concept that will be threaded throughout this course. This is your maternal child health course, and you are 2633. Again, welcome, and this is the very first module, which will encompass chapters 2, 3, 4, 6, and 10. That sounds like a lot of reading, but when you look at your textbook, it is very concise, well distributed, clearly marked, and you will find evidences of QCIN through evidence-based practice articles that are embedded within your text, and NCLEX. So you have the best of everything going on in this course this quarter. Health promotion is a huge issue. It cannot start and end in the confines of the hospital setting. It's a global perspective, it's a community perspective, and you, the nurse, have a huge impact to influence all of those, every layer. And we want to welcome you and to encourage you to do that. I have said in orientation in the past that I can teach you nursing skills. I can teach anybody nursing skills. And though we like to focus and think that that's the most important thing we are offering to our patients, that is a very small piece of what you will do. Your compassion, your care, your communication, the way you interact with your patient is going to state many more things about you than the skill that you were able to do. Your confidence, your professionalism, your appearance, your demeanor, your eye contact, and again, your um, therapeutic communication is huge. The impact you have in the very short period of time that you spend with your patients is huge and can have a rippling effect throughout your community and throughout the global confines when we start talking about the health issues that we will encounter during this quarter. So let's begin with health promotion. I've provided a PowerPoint presentation for you for this live lecture, or this recorded lecture, really. In addition to that, if there is time when we conclude this, I want to go through the module itself so that you understand what the tools are that are available to you within the module. I have found that students infrequently use them, which is unfortunate because they are there to help you and ease the burden of studying for the tests. I would encourage you to make this a large screen, uh, full screen if at all possible, so that you have a clearer picture. If you have any questions during this module, please jot them down somewhere and you will have to email me because this is going to be a recorded session and not a live session, obviously. Your objectives are clearly stated within the module. Module 1, but we'll review very briefly here. You need to identify the impact of Healthy People 2010 per your textbook, but I would like you to go beyond into 2020, the year 2020, and see what some of the health issues are that have been identified and initiated and what the impact is on your diverse families. <clears throat> Distinguish the cultural medical practices that we see sometimes with women and children. And oftentimes we use this as a basis for abuse. Um, and we have to recognize, first of all, that these are cultural, medically accepted practices in other countries. Even though we don't choose to use that technique, we still need to recognize it and then counter it with some proper education. We want to outline what health screening should look like for the lifespan. <clears throat> we will be focusing, of course, on women and children, but that goes beyond the influence we have on children as they're small and influenced, are, are so influential, we want to use so that they, that health need continues on through their life. Specifically when we're talking nutrition, specifically when we're talking about hygiene, interacting, social interactions with people, risk-taking behaviors that some adolescents will take on, we, if we can impact them now, perhaps we will see less and less of that. Differentiate normal from abnormal discomforts of pregnancy. We're also going to be talking about the GYN and the menstrual cycle, so we'll want to look at the normal and abnormal of that as well. 
identify very technology that will enhance the care of women and children. In fact, that is one of your discussions to recognize or first to identify, recognize, and then to research a little bit on some of the new technologies that you might even see at your local facilities that has had an impact on the care of women and children and why you think um, that has enhanced things. And then document research sources that will promote evidence-based practice. And that is a, something that's going to follow throughout the modules. Let's begin with health promotion. It begins with the patient. Because we're looking at the patient, we're seeing the patient, and we want to influence them. But we have to understand that that influence of that person, they may speak to others or have a global impact. If we teach one child how to wash their hands and others want to mimic him, then we may have an impact on an entire community at school of proper or better hygiene practices. This can then translate into much more global into the community. If he takes that home to his family and teaches his family we need to wash our hands after we go to the bathroom, then that's infecting now several children. Infecting was a proper word. Um, several children in the family, perhaps the mom and the dad, which then may impact their friends and it can, it can become um, very large impact in the global community. And one of the examples that they give is obesity. Childhood obesity has a has a huge impact and initially we wanted to take it only to the parental responsibility. Children are fed by their parents. Parents make choices of what children eat but if children don't know the difference about proper or improper nutrition and the parents aren't going to teach them anything different then how can we affect their health? Their health as they get older because now we have hypertensive disorders, we have cardiac disorders, we have more type 2 diabetes which then can lead to uh, de degenerative joint disease, immobility issues, and then that recycles itself into more chronic health, which has a huge impact on our medical community and then translates into a global problem if that individual cannot be productive, has some financial issues, housing issues, now becomes homeless, and that impacts the health of the other people he comes into contact with. So it can be translated into a very global uh, position. Who's responsible for health issues? So when we ask that question, you really have to look at a much broader picture. And that's why we're going to ask you to review Healthy People 2010, 2020, and what the healthcare delivery system is like for all. We know that there's some uh, disparities. We know that there, we have tried to meet some of those requirements or those, the lack of care with the new healthcare um, initiatives. I don't know that we have been successful. Um, we haven't had, we've had more demand than we've had the ability to meet the demand. And so if you are thinking about moving through your nursing career into an advanced practice role, it will be a great opportunity at this time for you because we're going to see that role be advanced and expanded to help meet those needs. So watch the trends. Obesity is one that they've challenged. Look at aging. Because of our technological advances, people are living longer. But are they living longer well, or are they living longer with chronic illnesses that now we keep under control? So we need to look at that as well. So instead of just giving you medication to take away your pain, or giving you medication to prevent or to improve your diabetic status or your hypertensive status, what are we doing to help impact the disease itself? So that is what we're looking at when we talk global. Then looking at infant care issues because that's where it should begin. If we can influence the women who are getting pregnant, influence the health of their fetus, that may influence the health of the infant. And on page 32, it's a very interesting outline of how a child grows and all the barriers, obstacles, risks that they face. In utero, what are the risks? And so once you get out of uterus, what are the risks to the baby? What is the risk to the toddler, to the growing child? And all the things they have to encounter and who is influencing them and how can the community impact that? Public policy, and that can go on indefinitely in a discussion, and I didn't want to outline anything, but one thing specifically that your book outlines is the abortion issue um, or the homelessness issue. 
the lack of immunization issue, the lack of health care issue. Those are public policies. And how can you as the nurse influence those? Who is given health care? Who is it provided to? How is it managed? Um, what are the barriers to that health care? All those things you need to recognize. And someone say, well, it's only financial. That's the barrier. I can't go see a doctor because I don't have insurance. That's not true. There's barriers because of gender, because of culture, because of language, because of transportation, because of time, because of fear, anxiety. So there's lots of barriers when you talk about health care provision. And we need to recognize that and meet that need with our patients as well. They happen to be right in front of you right now because there was probably an issue or a problem. But let's help them get into the health system so that those problems don't continue to arise. Health maintenance should be the forefront, and it is not. It is um, health curative, and we want to move it into more of a health maintenance. CAM stands for Complementary Alternative Medicines. So a lot of people, because they either cannot afford health care or they opt not to participate in a traditional Western medical health care, have moved to more homeopathic or alternative medicines. I'm not for or against. I'm just stating this fact. There's acupuncture, acupressure, herbal medicines, different nutritional impacts that have had some huge improved outcomes for people and we need to recognize that a lot of people embrace this but will not share that information with you because you the nurse represent the traditional Western medicine and we have to make sure we ask those questions because the interaction of some of the herbal choices they have with the prescribed medications may be deleterious and we need to talk to them about that so please don't forget to ask the question and see what that impact has had Technology in healthcare has expanded many fold over the last decade or even, well, century for sure, but definitely over the last decade. We now have telemedicine where we have a physician, a state of the art physician, or one of the foremost knowledgeable individuals in the treatment of that can be computer linked to a patient, both for discussions and for an exam. They can interact during a surgical procedure. It's amazing what's been happening in the world of medicine. We now have everyone by 2015, as I understand, or 2016, has to have electronic medical records, which will improve the communication or the care of the patient so there will not be this piecemeal medical care anymore. Um, it won't matter how many physicians you go to see, they will have the opportunity or the ability to see your medical records. So with electronic medical records, we have improved the communication, documentation, and a more seamless health care management. It's still in progress. It's still working. And there are still some glitches to that system. <clears throat> but it has improved health care overall for everyone. Then the ethical issues arise. And you were faced with some ethical dilemmas in your critical thinking and your intro to professional nursing. And I know it's also been touched on in every other course you've taken. <clears throat> you need to identify within yourself what your ethical barriers are. What do you accept or what will you not accept in the provision of care to your patients? You need to recognize that people come with all different ideas, thoughts, feelings, and needs. And if you're going to draw the line somewhere, <clears throat> or you're going to refuse to provide care to someone who's had an abortion, or if you're going to refuse to provide care to someone who has abused their child, um, you'll need to be able to step out, and you need to recognize what your risks and responsibilities are with that. And having said that, then, of course, HIPAA is a huge impact, especially in this course, because we have very sensitive issues that are taking place in the developing fetus, in the care of the newborn, in the care of the child, in the care of the adolescent, and what's been going on. We have to be very careful and very specific that we understand, again, what our risk and what our responsibilities are in HIPAA when dealing with these patients. That may be your daughter or your son's best friend laying in that bed, but you cannot take that information home to them, especially if it's something that has specifically happened to them sexually or with an STI or with a rape or an abuse, 
that has to stay within the confines of the hospital. Your neighbor abused their child and now you're taking care of them. In fact, if that were the case, I would ask that you would step away from that situation and not get involved. But then nor do you have access to any medical records on those people. And it has happened in the past that students have crossed that line and their seat in the school has been threatened. So you want to be very, very careful about that. This is a very litigious area to work in, obstetrics and pediatrics, especially obstetrics. So if you are thinking about moving into this arena, I welcome you, but I want to caution you that your documentation has to be pristine and timely so that you can recall at a moment's notice the events that took place that led you to the decisions that were made and the clinical judgments which then in, um, impacted the outcome. So again, I just caution you about all of those things. Now let's look into family. Family, who defines who the family is? When we're talking to a three-year-old, who is family? Is it grandma? Is it grandpa? Is it neighbor? Is it babysitter? Is it uh, their stepdad? Is it the boyfriend, the girlfriend? Who is family? It's always interesting to defer to children and watch to see who they respond to easiest or most comfortably. So even though the dad and the girlfriend are in the room with the child, we may see that the child gravitates more to the girlfriend. Or we say mom and stepdad and, and child gravitates to the stepdad perhaps because that's who they define as the influential person in that family. So you'll need to ask children, you'll need to ask women who their family is, and you can't ask it quite in that manner, but by watching, interacting, you will see the interaction of the family. So define that family first of all, and I've added some pictures here for you, because the elephants, you would say that that's a normal looking family, but the orangutan and the two leopards there would not be what we would consider a normal appearing family. So we have to recognize the diversity in culture. And please understand that culture is a very multifaceted word as well. We look not only at race, we not only look at class, religion, sexual orientation, age, um, financial. So there's lots of things that define the culture of that person. Back in the, your critical thinking course, you were introduced to Purnell, and he provided you with a model of cultural competency. If you could recall that, it would be in your best interest to recognize that we are made up of multiple cultures. We define ourselves in so many ways, and I think a great um, discussion was when you designed your Purnell model. Unfortunately, you were the only one that saw that, you and your instructor. It would have been nice to share that with your peers to then see the diversity just within your own class. Um, strong Irish Catholic versus the Jewish versus the, not, uh, the atheist versus the agnostic versus the person who respects medical care versus the person who doesn't respect medical care wants to see only a physician board certified who versus the person who will accept seeing a uh, physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner and it was very interesting to read your different synopsis so please recognize those different cultural influences you need to assess that <coughs> and while you're assessing that you need to recognize that families have stress there is an entire family stress theory that has been recognized and studied. And the reason we bring this up is as children are hospitalized, they rely on family. I am terribly sorry. I'm having some respiratory issues, apparently. How does the family cope? Because children are looking to the family for strength and guidance, because that's where they've always looked to. And if the family's falling apart and they're not coping with the stress of this hospitalization, or this illness, or this new diagnosis, the child will also not cope. We have learned that hospitalization for children, which we will learn later in Module 7, is a huge benefit in some respects because they learn to cope in this very uncomfortable environment. And if they can learn to take care of themselves, self-soothe, self-comfort within this very stressful environment and not have too much backsliding of regressive of behaviors and milestones, then they have learned to cope and under stress, which is going to facilitate itself into all walks of life. 
So in some respects, it does have some benefit. So what are the coping skills of this family? In fact, we need to ask them, who's their support system? Especially if we're dealing with a child who's been seriously injured or a woman who's um, going through some very traumatic issues with the pregnancy, the labor, the delivery. They delivered a baby that wasn't exactly healthy, normal. How are you going to help them cope with that new revelation? So what is the family development stage is also your textbook starts to define some of that for you. And I don't want you to spend a lot of time. But just like a person grows and develops, so does the family interaction. And it's going to change over time. The new married couple, we'll say, or the new couple that comes together have to learn each other's roles and um, responsibilities, so to speak, and how they interact. Then they add a third person with now some very demanding needs. And as that child grows, those needs become less and less demanding. And therefore, the roles in the family start to shift and change continuously. And unless they continue to grow and develop with those changes, you will find a family that is very stagnant. And then they may start relying on alternative measures to self-cope, such as alcohol or drugs or other risky activities, which then translate to the children as well. And you can see how the cycle would continue. <clears throat> when we're talking families, we also have to briefly look at parenting styles. And we know that there are three types of parenting styles that you're going to recognize and see in your textbook. And one of those styles is authoritarian, which is the more the dictator style. Then we have the laissez-faire, which is a very hands-off approach. And then we have authoritarian, I'm sorry, authoritative, which is much more the democratic style. Now, we would always prefer the democratic style, where people always have a voice. People get to choose. We use some rationalization as we talk about how we're going to interact. But we would find, in most cases and in most families, and if you look back at your childhood or you look at your current family situation, you will see that those roles or those styles change. You're not always the dictator, but you're not always the hands-off. You're not always democratic. It depends on the situation and what's been, what's been placed in front of you, how you will respond. So you are going to find yourself sometimes having to make a, a dictatorship decision. It's going to be my way. Or another time that I really don't care what you do. Either way, it's fine. This is a great opportunity for you to learn how to make proper decisions. And then there's the authoritative. Well, let's discuss about what your options are. Now, in those three scenarios I just presented, it's more for an adolescent or a school-aged child. But you're going to find that the parenting styles are going to change as the child grows and develops as well. So you, there's never one stagnant form. Discipline styles also. Your textbook is going to outline multiple discipline styles. What I want you to recognize is that discipline is all about education. It's all about teaching children. It's never meant to harm or to be in control. Now, having said that, I want you to understand for the infant and for the toddler, discipline is also about safety, keeping the child safe. And sometimes we have to react quickly and harshly if we're going to keep them safe. As they're walking up to the stove, you want to grab their hand away. That is not gentle and kind. That's rather harsh. And we're scared. So our fear sometimes facilitates how we respond. But the discipline style that intends to control or demean or um, take away a child's self-esteem has never been proven to be beneficial. And some of those styles, of course, would be yelling at the children constantly, demeaning them, reminding them of their limitations. Corporal punishment, which is hitting, slapping, or using physical punishment has also been shown not to be beneficial because it tends to teach children how to uh, cope. And that would be with striking other people to get control and power. What we have found to be beneficial is using distraction, using time out, using rationalization or reasonable um, discussions. Can't use that with all levels of children. Uh, what we've also found is withholding or withdrawing uh, privileges or something that they truly enjoy. The other issue with discipline is we have to be consistent. So that's another point. And we're going to be revisiting these topics 
when you get into the pediatric roles um, for children. And so I don't want you to forget that chapter four and five are here, or I'm sorry, chapter four and six are here for you. Cultural influence, we've already uh, somewhat discussed how parents um, discipline their child may be very cultural. In some cultures, I've traveled around the world and I've seen some children are allowed to do whatever they want at any time they want with whomever they want until they hit school age. And then all discipline changed to where it's much more corporal, much more uh, defined limitations on what their lifestyle was going to be. So it was very interesting. Uh, that was European, I saw. And in Asia, same thing. And it was very much a matriarchal society where the mothers set the rules. In fact, the mothers found their identity in their children. Their names almost changed to be no longer Mary, but now I'm Johnny's mother. So their names almost shifted due to the influence of children in that society. So cultural influences, which we'll have to recognize as we're um, nursing our, our children. And then let's look very briefly at family-centered care. We have really shifted hospital care from taking care of a patient to now in encompassing, embracing, and empowering the family and what the family influences on that patient and allowing the family to participate and, in fact, make decisions with the child or with the woman so that um, she has that support. And we have found it has really lessened our burden both physically and patient care-wise if we embrace and remember that our care planning is not nurse care planning, but patient care planning. And it should always be focused on the patient. And now in this course, of course, a little double entendre, it's about family. Now when we're looking specifically at chapter four and six, we're going to be talking about caring for women and children. We want to divide the different age groups into five areas. And you're going to look at those continually throughout the rest of this course. Those ages, of course, for children are infants, toddlers, preschool, school age, and adolescents. And you're going to find that there are some unique factors that are going to fall under each one of those categories. Please understand that the rate of growth for children, of course, initially in infancy is very, extremely rapid. Children um, increase their size and their weight and their abilities. They double all of those things within six months. And then the rate of growth starts to slow until we hit adolescence, and then it, it, it accelerates again. So your most rapid rate of growth is in infancy, the first six months, and again in adolescence. And the rest of the time, it's more defining. There's still growth going on, but it isn't as rapid. And in fact, toddlers, um, by the age of two, two and a half, their height is one half of what their adult height will be. So there isn't a lot more growth that has to take place. So let's look at some of those unique factors that are going to fall under each certain category. Um, of course, nutrition. Nutrition really gets put on the back burner always. And so when you're doing an assessment of your patient, please do not forget to discuss nutrition. Nutrition is the single most important influential factor in the growth and development of children. We have linked so many issues to poor or absent nutrition, either malnutrition or just a lack of. Obese children tend to be short in stature. They're not going to be as active, so hence it's going to have some huge impact on their cardiac system, their respiratory system, their lymphatic system, their endocrine system, their neurological system. Um, every system of the body is impacted by nutrition. So we really need to begin with that. And how do you figure out what's going on? You always start with a 24-hour recall or do a nutritional assessment. If you don't know what they're doing, we cannot impact them. If we don't understand the cultural influences, we cannot impact them. If we don't understand what their financial situation is, we cannot impact them. So please understand, when you're talking nutrition, you're just not talking about the foods. You're talking about what's your access to food? What's your basis for it? Are you a carb baby? Are you a protein baby? Are you a, a sweet tooth person? Got to have that dessert. Do you like your salads, your fruits, and your vegetables? 
What do you drink during the day? Is it only fruit juice because it tastes better? Children left to their own devices are always going to go to the sweet and the sugar substances once they're introduced to them. So if we can influence parents not to introduce those things too early into a child's life, they won't have the desire for it as greatly as if you influence it right from the beginning. Activity should also be influenced or be uh, entertained when we're talking nutrition as well. So some of the categories, and I've added some pictures finally because I'm sure this is getting a little dull to be just listening to. I've added some pictures. There's our little groovy toddler. Um, well, he's really an infant yet. He isn't walking. And then we have the school age child down at the bottom, which peers start to take a huge influence with. And then the adolescents, as you can see over there, uh, that they start to want to be very well defined with their group. So some of the categories that we want you to watch as we're starting, when, as we talk about the growth and development of children is, what are the physical and developmental milestones? Please understand that you will be intimately linked to Dr. Erickson through this course. You need to understand that after nutrition, their developmental stages are huge. You need to recognize them and understand what is the normal and when you see a child falling outside what those developmental stages are. There are five stages that we were going to focus on and they are trust versus mistrust, autonomy, industry, initiative, and identity. There is a developmental stage of intimacy, but that falls after the 18th year chronologically. It doesn't mean that children haven't moved into that role sooner, it just means that the milestone for them is after 18. Um, there are chronological ages that go with those, and I'll need you to recognize that. And I'll need you to recognize when a child is stuck in a developmental stage. And there are some adults that are still stuck in the trust versus mistrust. And you will find that it has had an impact or an influence on their ability to socialize and to have some relationships. When we're looking at also is dental care, Dental care can have a huge impact on how we feel and how we interact, how we eat, sleep and activities. Some parents, due to their working uh, environment, have shifted the sleeping patterns or the activity patterns of their children to meet their needs. And we need to have the parents refocus on what the need of the child is. Activity is huge. They have, uh, I know some of the big sports teams have really been influencing how children uh, get out and play. I think it's, isn't it called 60 plus or something? I, I don't know what some of the programs are, but that would be a great discussion post uh, as to what some of the new activity programs are. Injury prevention changes throughout the lifestyle, the lifespan, excuse me. Again, injury prevention initially is because of curiosity and because of lack of coordination. So we want to watch, but the most, most common injury for all children is motor vehicle accidents. First of all, we do not restrain our children safely in our vehicles when they're babies, when they're infants, when they're toddlers. And then later on, children are out on their own motorized vehicles, either bicycles or skateboards or um, scooters, and so we need to have them be very cognizant of their environment so they're not darting out in front of other vehicles because that's where that happens. And then, of course, adolescents get their driver's license, have no boundaries for what their risk is and cause or are involved in accidents that can either be fatal or very detrimental to their life. Discipline, um, so motor vehicle accidents, huge. Discipline, we've mentioned briefly, please recognize what discipline would align with what age group. Um, some are not reasonable, of course. We cannot use rationalization or withdrawal for an infant because they're really not going to understand that that's a disciplinary issue. Toddlers may not understand it as well either, but your preschool, school age, and adolescent most definitely are going to understand those things. Play is a huge issue for children. It recognizes, uh, or we should recognize that play is our barometer for health. If a child is not active or does not want to play or interact with others, they're really, really ill. Um, it's their work. It's what they focus on. This is how they grow and they develop. And so we want to understand that play has some real, true benefits. It benefits their creativity, their socialization, their language. Um, their ability to interact. It teaches them how to cope. 
It teaches them some limitations. But it really has very little to no influence on actual growth. I'm not going to get taller because I play basketball. I'm not going to get faster necessarily, or that's not even a proper. But when we're talking growth, it really doesn't have a lot of influence. Now, when you're talking muscle strength, absolutely, but that's not what we're referring to when we're talking about growth. But play has a huge impact, and you need to recognize it as a huge benefit. Now, there are several different kinds of play. And again, please read those and study those and recognize which age groups go with those, what the outliers are, what the red flags would be when you're seeing that type of play with children. It can be huge. Play is a great way to interact with your child patient. It's a great way to, to communicate, sometimes giving them tools to demonstrate for you or to color a picture for you or to draw a picture. Drawings tell you lots of things about what's going on with a child and their family. The colors they choose, the size that they make the, uh, the people tell you the interactions and the um, family lineup, so to speak. Risk-taking behaviors, we start to see that in the preschool, school age, and the adolescent, of course. We need to recognize those when we talk about alcohol, drugs, uh, suicide prevention, motor vehicle, um, some of the secret societies, sometimes their dress, and, and help parents to recognize those things, too, and not be oblivious. Weapons is the other thing that becomes a huge problem, especially in the school age and the, and the adolescent. And then peers and influences. Um, peers become a huge influence starting in school, preschool a little bit, school age for sure, and then definitely adolescence. And what is the interaction of the uh, parent and the adolescent? So you'll need to kind of look at all of those things. In fact, I believe in module six or seven, there is a tool that is going to help you uh, outline those things very briefly, quickly, so that you don't have to spend a lot of time restudying, and it'll be all in a graphic. Um, not graphic, but a table format for you so that it's right there in front of you for studying purposes. Now when we look specifically at the care of women, um, you need to again begin with a full assessment and begin with a history. We always start with our histories. And since we really should start our conversation this quarter with the care of women because we're, then we're talking about pregnancy before we move on to infants and then children, we need to kind of look at this first. So what, what Components are in a history. Well, let me help you a little bit with that. First of all, it's the demographics. You need to understand the patient's name, of course, and their age, because their age is going to kind of um, move you in which direction you want to take this conversation or your assessments. You want to, just for record keeping, you may want to know if they have insurance or not have insurance, because that may influence. Um, where you send them for a test, or what type of diagnostics, or what type of medications, because there are the generic and the labeled medications that we would provide. Now, I've never re suggested that finances should influence how you care for a patient, but sometimes it helps us to recognize when we're talking nutrition even with them. They may not have the financial backing to have fresh fruits and vegetables, so maybe you can help them find alternative beans if you know what their financial situation is. So in that respect, you would need to know. Um, perhaps their cultural or religious requirements or obstacles for your health care. Then let's look at current illness or current issue. What's going on right now? Under that big category, we want to put allergies, current medications, uh, any issues that are happening right now. Let's talk past medical history. Find out what's been going on in their past. Do they have chronic hypertension? Do they have diabetes? Do they have an autoimmune disease? Do they have an issue somewhere? Then let's look at past surgical history. I try to keep these all in separate buckets so that I don't blur the lines. I apologize because my phone has just gone off and now the recorder is going off and making lots of noise. So if you hear it in the background, I do apologize. So we've talked past medical history, past surgical history. Let's talk about family history. What are the social issues? Do we, where do they live? Are they working? Are they safe? This is where you can get the abuse question lodged in. 
Um, are they safe? Do they feel like they have a good relationship with whoever their support system is? Who is their support system? What type of work do they do? Are there toxins? Are they outside all the time? Uh, are they lifting heavy equipment? What about their hearing protection? What about sun protection? So all those things should be discussed. Um, who is their support system? You need to know that as well. Do they smoke? Do they drink? Do they use any medications or drugs that would interact with any medications or med medicines that we need to give to them? So this is a great time to bring that question up. People say, well, they're never going to share that with me. They will if they feel like they're developing a rapport with you. If you're not there to judge them and promise, not promise them, please don't promise anything to your patients. But if you assure them that this isn't for legal purposes, it's only for medical purposes. Uh, family history. We need to know family history, and usually just first generation. What about your parents? What about your siblings? What about any other children that you've had that may have a genetic link, psychiatric link, or hypertension, diabetes, cancers, where the cancer is located, especially for women if we're talking breast cancer, ovarian, or endometrial cancers. Then let's talk about the obstetrical and GYN. That's an umbrella that you can separate out from the past medical history, especially if we're talking pregnancy. GYN, I'd want to know if there were any GYN surgeries, if there's any, been any GYN problems or complaints. What about a history of STIs? You'll want to know all those things. Obstetrically, I want to know how many pregnancies you've had. That includes all abortions. You're going to want to know if they've delivered any babies, if they were vaginal or cesarean section deliveries. Were there any complications with the pregnancy? Were there any complications with the delivery? Were there any complications with the baby? What was the weight of the baby and the date of the birth? Now, there's very few women that cannot remember the dates or the weights of their babies. So when you haven't filled those things out in your assessments, I know that you either haven't talked to your patients or you haven't gone clearly into their, assess or into their histories. Let's talk about contraception. Let's talk about um, if they even want to have a baby. We need to be talking to them a little bit about their menstrual cycle. Is it normal? What's considered normal for them? Some people have very heavy menses, and that's normal. Some people have very light menses, and that is normal. Uh, some people have a lot of pain. Some don't have a lot of pain. So we need to find out what their normal parameter is before we start designing a care plan. We want to know their nutritional history. Oh, immunization should also go under current illness. We negate always the immunization history in adults because we don't think about it as much as we do when we're dealing with children, but that's important. When was their last tetanus? Have they completed the hepatitis series? Have they completed their cervical cancer series, the Gardasil or the newer products that are out there? So that is your history, uh, I believe. I probably may have left something out. If I have, please counter me. Um, and you can email me and let me know I've left something out. But you should, if you follow the same schematic, you will never make an error. Once you've completed the history, of course, then you're going to go on to do a physical exam. Now, the physical exam is the same as any other exam, head to toe, except now with the GYN exam, we're focusing a little bit more on a specific area of the body, the vaginal exam, external um, genitalia, as well as the internal exam. You as the nurse will not be doing the internal exams, but you will be assisting someone else. So you need to be prepared to help the, mo the mom, help the patient be comfortable, put them in a position of comfort, explain what's going to happen, um, hopefully have all your specimens labeled correctly because you do not want to make an error. And there are some horrific legal um, cases I can share with you of mislabeling that cause some very um, horrific, again, I like that word, outcomes. <clears throat> oh, and you will want to know if they're using any type of contraception or not. So let's um, talk specifically about the menstrual cycle again. Uh, we're going to cover that in another slide. Contraception, you'll want to know, and then the GYN exam. Of course, you know that the GYN exam purpose is to identify cervical cancer. That is the only reason we do pap smears. Now, a nice part of the pap smear, especially the new paps, which are the thin prep, is that we can also identify some STIs. Or we can specifically do some STI testing for chlamydia, gonorrhea, herpes. Um, we can do cultures, but they're not real specific. You can also do condyloma or HPV typing with your pap smears. So that is very beneficial. Now, if you're going to ask for any other 
STI testing as a serum for syphilis, HIV, again, hepatitis is a serum, uh, blood draw. Most of the STIs are now reportable to the health department, and that happens through the lab, so you're really not involved with that. Some of the other health issues for women depends on their age. If we have a very young, sexually active individual, then of course we want to be really talking about safe sex and um, contraception and STI prevention. If you're talking about older women who are not sexually active or are not as sexually active or are in a monogamous relationship, those might not be the forefront of their thought process. We may be talking more about menopausal issues now, what's happening as she's aging. What about osteoporosis? How do we manage breast care? What about the comorbidities as we age, hypertension, diabetes, joint disease, um, heart disease? We need to be talking about those things and setting up for labs and diagnostics that we can identify those things as well. But again, never forget about flu vaccines, pneumonia vaccines, tetanus vaccines, um, anything else that they might need some talking with. Um, and again, we don't want to forget about safety issues for these women. Do they smoke? Do they drink? Do they drive? Do they use a seatbelt? Uh, are they texting while they're driving? What about, uh, do they have a job with um, a lot of noise, so are they using hearing protection, sun protection, hydration protection, and joint protection. Talk about proper mechanics and, of course, nutrition. This is one of those graphic pictures I should have warned you about. This is your chlamydia. To the left of your screen is a healthy, normal cervix and what it should look like. To the right of your screen is a chlamydia, chlamydia influenced cervix. It's red, it's beefy, it has a lot of discharge. Um, again, if we do not protect them from chlamydia, it's going to cause infertility. Syphilis, again, the left picture is a chancre, which is a painless, painless opening in the vulva area, which we sometimes ignore. So this is your primary syphilis. Your secondary syphilis is that rash you see on the hands and the feet. And then you also know that there's a tertiary stage of syphilis which causes end-stage organ damage. Now, that is sits silent, so we're not aware of it until, indeed, we do have some heart problems or kidney problems or liver failure or some dementia or some uh, cerebral issues that then we recognize and do a serum draw to find that the patient is, indeed, positive for syphilis. This is a bacteria. The last two, chlamydia and syphilis, are both bacteria, which means they're easily treated, but we have to find them to treat them. Condyloma is a virus, again, HPV is a human papillomavirus, which is to your left screen there, that is a condyloma, and you can see where she's had some lesions already removed. This is a very mild case. Men and women can present with this, um, these symptoms of having the cauliflower looking gross or lesions on their vulva or anywhere that the virus has come into contact with a, a broken mucous membrane or a very translucent mucous membrane. We're now finding that more and more men and women are having throat cancer related to HPV, and I believe that it might be secondary to the sexual practices. Cervical cancer is to your right, and again, we will not find that if we don't go looking for it, which means the patient has to come in. So we have to try to obliterate, obliterate the barriers to health care. Women don't come in for health care because of time, inability to get an appointment, finances, fear, anxiety, not understanding what they're doing or why they're doing it, and the rapidity, I will state too that our, our time with a patient is so limited now that they feel rushed, and so why bother coming in? I waited an hour in your office to see you for five minutes. The time disparency there is not worth my effort. This is herpes to your right, I'm sorry, to the left is herpes. The bottom picture is the blistered looking cluster blisters that we would see. The above is the oral herpetic lesions that you will see orally, and that is on a child. Then you see to the right of your page is trichomoniasis, which is a protozoan, again, easily treated, and then yeast, which is an ant we have to use antifungals for and are very common. In fact, which patients are at the largest risk for yeast infections? 
If you have said someone who's on antibiotics, yes. Someone who's immunocompromised, yes. Someone has a diet full of sugars or carbohydrates, yes. Someone with HIV, yes. Someone that is diabetic, yes. Someone with poor hygiene, perhaps. But that isn't usually the leading cause. It, it is really a nutritional linked problem. And then if that does not take care of the problem, then we should be looking at HIV um, and diabetes. And of course, they're compromised, their immunocompromised status. Now, the normal menstrual cycle, please understand that it is not necessarily a 28 day cycle. Some women have 28 days, some have 21, some have 30, 35 days. So we have to ask the patient what is normal for them. The word menarche, M E N A R C H E, represents the very first menstrual cycle, which we are finding women much younger now are having their very first menstrual cycle. Initially, menstrual cycles are irregular, and then they move to much more regularity. So we can be talking to women um, about what their menstrual cycles are like. Ovulation is the time where the egg is released because of the influences of the estrogen and progesterone. Please read through the chapter on the menstrual cycle. Understand that the two most influential influential hormones are estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is a growth hormone. It makes things bigger, grow. So during the menstrual cycle, estrogen causes the ovary, ovum, the egg, inside the ovary to mature. Estrogen also causes the lining of the uterus to grow, the endometrial lining to grow and get thick in anticipation of a fertilized egg. That's like a little nest then. Estrogen also causes the breast to grow and get lumpy and uncomfortable, especially in pregnancy. So estrogen in pregnancy causes everything to grow. It's a growth hormone. Progesterone on the counter side causes things to get thicker, fuller, quieter, slower, takes the stress out. If you break the word progesterone down, it stands for pro-life, pro-gestation, pro-life. It is the most important, may I repeat, the most important hormone of pregnancy is progesterone. It is not HCS, or I'm sorry, HCG which is the human chorionic gonadotropin, which is necessary for the initiation of a pregnancy, but it is not necessary for the maintenance. Progesterone is essential for the maintenance of a pregnancy or it will not survive. Progesterone causes the endometrial lining to get thicker, fuller, richer, more blood. So that it's a beautiful, soft area, nutrient, rich area for the egg to embed in. Progesterone makes the breast fuller, thicker, heavier. Milk ducts start to expand and get ready for milk production. And that's why you get the lumpy bumpies in your breasts. Progesterone causes your bowel to shut down. So hence we have some constipation. Progesterone may have some influence on nausea, vomiting, and GERD in pregnancy. Progesterone may make you a little hazy in the brain, so we call it pregnancy brain, where you're just not real acutely keen on some areas because, and you're a little more forgetful because you're more focused on the baby and keeping yourself safe. Progesterone causes the blood circulation, not necessarily to slow, but it's not as precise, and so we have more risk for DVTs during pregnancy under the influence of progesterone. So do you understand the two hormones? Estrogen is your growth, grow, get bigger hormone, and progesterone is your thicker, acquiescent, quieter, slows things down hormone. One is more essential than the other, but the, the two work in tandem together. You need them both for a successful menstrual cycle and a successful pregnancy. Please understand that the menstrual cycle really requires four organs to be working in concert together. If one of them is not functional or is not working at its optimum, the menstrual cycle will shut down. 
And there are things we do to influence that stress, poor nutrition, lack of activity, too much body fat, too little body fat, too much activity, drugs, alcohol, medications we take um, can all influence the menstrual cycle. And there is only a very small window of time. The egg only lasts for 24 hours that you can even get pregnant. So it amazes me that we have so many pregnancies based on that scientific knowledge. However, having said that, may I also include that that is the time that women are the most amorous. That's a polite way to say they're looking for sexual activity. Sometimes they're not too fussy about where they get it. Because now is the time the egg is mature and ready for conception. So they are doing what they can to get what they need to make that happen. You have to have the egg and the sperm come together. The egg lives for 24 hours. A sperm will live up to three to five days based on what literature you're looking at. Only one sperm will find its way to the egg and penetrate the egg and conception will begin. Ovulation takes place in the middle of the menstrual cycle. We cannot go from, I cannot tell you from the day you start your period to the day that you will ovulate. But I can tell you from the day you ovulate to when you'll start your next menstrual cycle. But that's some, so it's a retrospective study or a retrospective inquiry as I've called it here on your, tech, on your slide. So from the day of ovulation to the day of your next menstrual cycle is always 14 days. That never changes. But the day of your menstrual cycle to the date of your ovulation is variable based on your nutrition, your activity, stress, other influences, hormonal influences that are going on. The four organs that are required to be acting in concert is your hypothalamus, your pituitary gland, your ovaries, and your uterus. You should probably throw thyroid in there as well too because thyroid can have some influence as well. But it is your hypothalamus which the, has the GRNH, the gonadotropin releasing tropin hormone that causes your ovaries to start releasing estrogen and progesterone. And while it's rele and that is also making the ovum get a little bit bigger. So one ovum should stand out to say, I want to be the one that gets released. Remember, women are born with all the eggs they're ever going to have, where men continually manufacture new sperm. So this egg gets released under the influence of the estrogen and progesterone and the influence of the GRNH. The brain sends GRNH down to the ovaries to say, okay, make your estrogen and progesterone. And the estrogen and progesterone go back to the brain saying, okay, I have enough of what you're giving me. My egg is big enough now. Shut down. When that shuts down, there's a release of LH, luteinizing har hormone, that causes the egg to pop out of the ovum, or the ovary, I'm sorry. And the frimbria or fingers of the fallopian tube will start to pull. So the ovary is free floating. The egg is now free floating in the abdomen and the fingers pull the egg and draw it into the fallopian tubes. There are two fallopian tubes attached to the uterus which are transport only bringing the egg to the uterus. Once it lands in the uterus we have embed it starts